Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam and the focus of our lecture today is on semantics and pragmatics. Although we're gonna focus on semantics and pragmatics today, we're actually gonna cover the topic of semantics uh, several times throughout the course. So this is gonna be our first pass to cover some of the interesting and relevant topics in semantics and pragmatics. We're also going to discuss semantics next week when we cover prototype theory or family resemblance concepts. Okay, so that'll be another opportunity for us to think about research in semantics. We will then, the next time we cover semantics will be in our section on the neuro, cognitive neuroscience of linguistic processing. So we'll talk about syntactic processing as well as semantic processing. So when we discuss cognitive neuroscience, we'll look at semantics once again. And then the next time we cover semantics will be towards the end of the course when we focus more on Turing machines, neural networks, and artificial intelligence. We will look at truth, um, truth tables, truth conditional semantics, and then how that leads to the development of logic gates and logic circuits. And then that naturally ties into research and development in artificial intelligence. So I love this topic. I think semantics and pragmatics are fascinating issues. And I did my PhD um, in linguistics with my dissertation on the semantics, pragmatics, and cognition of slurs. So this is, I think, an issue that's are really fascinating and, and dear to me personally. So we're going to uh, touch upon this at several different points within the course, okay? We read a few important articles for today. Uh, two of the articles are by John Searle, okay? The, one of the articles was entitled Literal Meaning, and the other article was entitled What is a Speech Act, okay? Why I wanted you to read the articles, these articles for today, is because so far throughout the course, notice that we've been focusing, for example, in the last few lectures when we're working through syntax, we've been focusing on the linguistic items themselves, right? Like the locutions were taking center stage of our attention, right? We were, in other words, we were thinking about words and how words can combine to form uh, phrases and sentences and how we can build hierarchical structures using linguistic items and rules for their felicitous construction, right? What we weren't thinking about though is what speakers or language users do with words, right? So we were not thinking about language as an act, as a speech activity that participants engage in. Another way to say this is we were thinking about language in a more abstract, detached way um, in the previous lectures. And so what we're gonna do today is try to contextualize and situate uh, language uh, within the context of speech acts, okay? So language is not just a thing that exists by itself, but it's uh, language is also something that we use and we uh, perform activities with, okay? I think that this is, a very, very important insight. Okay, obviously I wrote my PhD on this sort of topic. So I got a lot out of this when I was an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. All right, so this article by Searle, Literal Meaning, it does a good job. Searle is, another reason why we read this article by Searle is John Searle is an exemplary scholar when it comes to philosophy of language. So like I've mentioned previously, one of the best ways to develop strong skills in cognitive science, like if you wanna become a cognitive scientist, you wanna become a philosopher of language, one of the best things you can do to develop your skill is to read a lot in your area, right? So if you wanna become a philosopher of language, one of the best things you can do is read lots of good examples of philosophy of language, okay? And I think John Searle is one of those producers of excellent examples. I read a lot of his work as an undergraduate and it's, it's excellent in terms of its clarity and how you should go about writing very clear philosophical arguments, okay? There's a, a good use of examples in his work. Um, the only sort of thing that I would recommend for you, right, uh, as a student 
is to cite more sources. So that's sort of the only, um, well, one of the, the uh, critiques or suggestions I have for philosophers is that they often don't cite uh, very frequently, like you'll see in the articles that we read, there is some mention of important figures, but it's very different than, for example, in the psychological sciences where we're giving credit to each person and the contribution that they made, okay? And I'm not saying that your philosophy articles have to be embedded with all these citations, but you may think about providing those citations in a footnote or endnotes at some point, giving credit to previous work is part of what it means to be a scholar in the field, right? If you really are a philosopher of language, then you should be able to talk and cite all the other work that's going on in the philosophy of language, okay? So read Searle as an example of excellent work. And then I would just suggest on top of what you gather from that, try to also include citations, right? Specific citations to other work that's relevant, okay? So you might cite Austin, Right? You might cite Grice, right? you might cite other important figures in semantics and pragmatics. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so one of the cool things about this article and this figure that we're going to look at is that Searle's going to make a very important point in this article. Right, We often have this idea, right, and this is a sort of the traditional or received view in the philosophy of language, is that we can sort of uh, get the meaning of a sentence from the sentence itself, right? Like the cat is on the mat, right? Presumably all the information we need to understand the literal meaning of that sentence is there for us, right? The cat is on the mat. We have, right, we got um, our noun phrase and our verb phrase. We have those words refer to things in the world. So, you know, intuitively, there's nothing problematic about the sentence. The interesting point here though, that Searle is making is that we actually need to think about this received view or this traditional view, right? Is it really the case that everything we need to understand the meaning, the literal meaning of that sentence is sort of explicitly represented in that sentence for us, right? Or is our understanding of the sentence sort of occurring within a context of background knowledge, right? And that's important, right? We might, um, we, might we might develop different philosophies of mind and language based on which approach we believe, right? The received traditional approach or Searle's critical approach here, right? This may also generate different predictions for cognitive neuroscience, right? Um, when we interpret this sentence, is there any background processing that's going on also? Or are we just like reading these things off straight away, right? So we see that these different theories, they're interesting philosophically, but also they generate interesting predictions and other avenues of research in our sub-disciplines across the cognitive sciences. So I think that's also uh, another reason why you should read philosophy, right? Throughout the course, you notice we're reading articles from different sub-disciplines. Some of you like philosophy, some of you like neuroscience more, right? You gravitate towards your own disciplines or sub-disciplines. Um, however, I always encourage you as cognitive scientists to be well-rounded, um, at least in the areas that you care mostly about, like language, music, emotion, right? And read somewhat widely across the subfields in your chosen topic area, right? Like emotions, language, or music. Okay, it'll help you generate new ideas for projects, for theoretical approaches, whereas if all you do is read, like, if I'm just a psychologist of language and all I do is read psychology of language, I may miss out some very interesting ideas, theories, predictions, okay? So here what we're looking at is, is it the case that the cat is on the mat is sort of in order to interpret the literal meaning of that sentence, everything we need to interpret that sentence literally is explicitly provided in that sentence. Or is it the case that for any sentence, we need to interpret it with sort of like background knowledge, okay? Like within the context or in relation to background assumptions, presumptions, um, things like that, okay? 
All right, so the way that we'll sort of uh, pump the intuitions is we'll look at this case and we'll ask, is this sentence, uh, first look at the picture, right? Look at this figure of the cat and then read the sentence, the cat is on the mat. Now I wanna ask you, is this sentence true or false? Or is it the case that this sentence doesn't yet have a determinant truth value, okay? On this first figure, it may look very intuitive that, well, for sure the cat is on the mat, right? Like we can see right here, this thing looks like a cat and this thing looks like a mat and the cat is on the mat. Okay, boom, the cat is on the mat. We can assume that, sure, that, that sentence has everything we need to interpret that um, sentence correctly. Okay, but now imagine that I give you some additional knowledge, right? So perhaps I'm a, a physics professor, right? And I tell you all this interesting information about right, the subatomic nature of particles, the, um, I, I talked to you about uh, gravitational forces and, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you about physics at a really fine grain level, right? Maybe over the course of a whole semester, right? So it's like, now you have a lot of deep knowledge about particle physics, about quantum theory, right? And given all the information I provide you, right? We might now understand that actually in physical entities, there's actually a lot more space, right? Between um, we're not, I mean, we're solid at one level, right? Like at, at one level, my hands are touching, but if we zoom in at a super, super fine level, right? We might see that there's in fact no touching going on, right? At the perceptual, perceptual level, it looks like my hands are touching each other. But if we look down, right? At a super, super fine grain level, right? At the level of particles or even subatomic particles, right? Things even at a smaller scale, we might see that in, it's no longer clear that there's physical contact of one thing on another, right? There may just be cases of fields in relation to each other or whatnot, whatever our best theoretical account of physics is at the time, okay? So the important point here is not that we now, ah, this sentence is false right? But rather, given that knowledge that you now have about the world, right? It's, it's no longer so clear as it was just a minute ago that the cat is on the mat, right? Maybe uh, the non-physics you thinks this is for sure a case of the cat is on the mat, so that's true. But maybe for a professor of physics, maybe I've been publishing on physics like my whole life. And so like, I only think in these terms, you may think, well, no, clearly that's false that the cat is on the map because we know better than to say such rudimentary things about the world, for example, right? So that's one way in which our background knowledge and assumptions can sort of influence our interpretation of these sentences, okay? And the imp one of the important points that Searle is gonna make here that you know, we might think, oh, well, I can just add more detail into the sentence, right? Maybe the issue here is like, I didn't provide enough detail in that sentence. Like the sentence is too rudimentary with only six words in there. But maybe if I said something more detailed, right? Like according to this theory of physics, right? Uh, macroscopic physics or at a larger scale that then this holds true, right? So what I've done is sort of packed in additional linguistic representation to try to get that literal meaning more explicitly self-contained, right? Maybe that's the solution, right? And Searle is gonna suggest that that's not the case, right? Because for anything else that we pack in there, right? We can, um, anything else that we add into sort of the linguistic explicit linguistic representation that that interpretation is also going to carry additional background assumptions okay so in some sense Searle's going to say no matter how much we throw into that sentence right I can make that sentence incredibly detailed right um relating this sentence to a particular theory to a particular theory that was 
believed to be mostly true within a particular time period, in a particular part of the world, right? I could try to pin as much additional details to the sentence to make it explicit and self-contained, but Searle's point's gonna be that no matter how much we pack into there, we still interpret that with background assumptions, okay? So there's gonna be sort of a contextualism involved in our interpretations, okay? That in some sense seems inescapable, okay? We'll look at one more example that's going to sort of uh, continue to challenge the received or traditional view in the philosophy of language that we can just sort of get the literal meaning of things sort of by themselves. Okay, and this the this figure, um, we want to ask the same sort of question, right? Look at the picture and read the sentence. The cat is on the mat, and then I want you to tell me: is the sentence true or false? or does it not yet have a determinate truth value? Okay, so the, the intuition here, excuse me, at least Searle argues in the article, is that um, based on like our default knowledge of the world, right? This case looks a little bit less clear than the previous case, right? In this case, it seems pretty, right? It seemed pretty clear until I gave you the professor of physics sort of, um, um, counter thought to this, this looks a little bit less intuitive than this one, right? Is that this one, right? It, it looks like it's false that the cat is on the map, right? Or at least it's highly, it would be highly misleading. If I said to you, right? Um, if, if you asked me, hey, where is your cat, right? And I said, oh, my cat's on the map, right? Over there, right? by default, right, without giving you any additional information, you may assume that, oh, okay, the cat's laying on a mat in a configuration that looks more like this, right? And then if I showed you my cat and it was on a mat that looked like that, you would be very surprised, right? You might even accuse me of um, being highly misleading towards you in describing this as a situation in which the cat is on the mat. Right, but Searle offers us more thoughts to consider, right? Just like I gave you more thoughts to consider about a professor of physics, right? How that background knowledge might change our interpretation of that sentence. Searle's gonna give us more background knowledge to change our interpretation of this sentence, okay? So Searle argues, now suppose, right? We're at home or in our backyard and we have a lot of items that are positioned maybe like on a rack at an angle, okay? So maybe I have like a shovel, maybe there's like, I have a few skateboards, uh, maybe there's like a bow staff. There's just items that I have from my house that are uh, stacked at, at this angle, right? And maybe also uh, philosophers are great at creating up these, creating these examples. Maybe also I have a mat or a rug, right? A mat that, Un, um, due to some treatment, like glue hardening process, it looks very stiff like this in this configuration, okay? Maybe I have mats like this when I, um, in order to sort of like package them up and ship them out to sell them and ship them to different locations, right? Maybe it just makes it easier for me to um, have individual items instead of them all folding up on each other and being hard to manage, okay? So just assume that I have a mat that's um, stiff like this, and it's now along that rack with all the other items that are also at this angle, okay? So now, since both of us are in my backyard and we know that all the, the rack has all these items positioned at an angle, you might ask me, hey, Adam, where's your cat? Right. And I might say, oh, the cat's on the mat. Right. And in that case, you know, or at least now it seems to be more intuitively true. Right. Ah, oh, okay. Well, yes. Uh, if, if I, in other words, if I showed you this picture, you're no longer surprised. Right. Since your default knowledge was no longer of sort of all objects being horizontal or flat on the floor, now your default assumption has changed based on your background knowledge or presuppositions about the world, okay? And, you know, we could, the, the important thing here is that as philosophers or those of us engaged in thought experiments, almost for any sentence, right, we can 
um, provide more discussion, changing the background conditions to make that sentence true or false. Okay, and in some sense, the important point here is that before we sort of uh, fix or uh, set the relation, the sentence doesn't really have a truth value, right? It's indeterminate, okay? All right, uh, so these are some of the arguments that are presented, um, just challenging the traditional received view in the philosophy of language that we can just right away sort of explicate the literal meaning of our uh, sentences, our utterances, um, in themselves without respect to background knowledge, okay? So Searle challenges this traditional view, arguing instead that the notion of the literal meaning of a sentence only has application relative to a set of contextual or background assumptions. And if any of you are familiar with my work yet, you can see how I really made use of this context dependency in the interpretation of slurs, right? Sort of one of the very interesting things about slurs, and there's other linguistic items that are like this, but when certain people use slurs, right? Like if I use a slur that's typically used to target Asian Americans, but I'm using the slur with like one of my best friends, say it's a friend that I grew up with, we went to the military together, we completed our PhDs together, but I like my best friend and, you know, like essentially like another version of me you might think of, right? Well, on um, this view, right, given the, our, our shared, identity, our shared background knowledge, and just common knowledge that under most circumstances throughout life, we were not targeting each other in a negative way, but throughout life, we were just in general supportive of each other. We see that that background knowledge about speaker identity, about history, and other important features influence the interpretation of what I might mean by a slur, right? However, if a slur typically used to target Asians is not used among Asians, but say an outgroup member, right? Um, a non-Asian towards an Asian, right? And imagine they're not just different, they're not just of different racial um, and ethnic groups, but also like they don't know each other. Perhaps they've never met. And this is the first time that they're in contact with each other. Maybe, right? They're uh, they vary in age and many different factors, right? Another way to think about this is like the opposite of you, right? So you can think of like in-group usage as on the model of me using a word with me or something that approximates me and out-group usage being me using a word with non-me or something appro approximating the opposite of me, right? And we can see that depending on who's using which slur, it can be interpreted either highly offensive, right, in a highly offensive manner or in a more in-group way, okay? And there's some interesting work on the reappropriation or reclamation of slurs and how slurs are used to mean um, more positive things than what the out-group usage is used to mean, okay? So we know that throughout the history of slur usage, for example, against African-Americans, that the N-word has been used in highly derogatory contexts, right? The, the use um, from non-African-Americans towards African-Americans has often been, like the context of use has all often been um, involved in like hate crimes, physical violence and whatnot, right? So, but the use of the slur in in-group context has a very different meaning because the context of use is different, okay? Um, when in-group members use a word amongst each other, it can signify something more like of a solidarity meaning, right? Whereas when it's used by non-in-group members, it has more of a derogatory offensive meaning, okay? And if you're interested in this, then please take the course with me. I'm teaching a whole course on slurs and stereotypes. And also I've published like a, over a dozen articles on this topic, okay? Um, and some of them are included in the file section for you to check out, okay? The important thing though for today is not to um, 
get into the details of my work, but I'm just highlighting my work on the context dependency of slur interpretation to show how this insight here from Searle can be highly productive to your own work and to work not just in philosophy, but more generally in linguistics and cognitive science, okay? All right, awesome, let's keep it going. So once again, to be very clear, the I want you to not only understand the theoretical views, like what does Searle believe, but also like, why does he believe this? There, there's two arguments I've already, uh, suggested or highlighted one of these for you, but I, I just want to be clear on this slide and highlight both of them, okay? So according to Searle in this article, there are two main reasons why the background of assumptions, right, background knowledge um, for the literal meaning of a sentence, like the cat is on the mat, cannot be fully and explicitly represented, okay? Like we can't get the, we can't just pack into that sentence more things to let it be a self-sustaining, meaningful item, right? And these are the reasons why. First, background assumptions are indefinite in number, right? There isn't actually a definite number of assumptions, uh, the set of which we can pack into our sentence and now we're good to go, right? It's not like there's 364 um, feet, uh, bits of background knowledge and once I plug all those in, now I'm done, right? The point is that there's an, uh, an indefinite number of background assumptions, right? And it, it could it could change, right? The question to ask yourself is, what do you have to know or presuppose? What is what background knowledge must you assume when you interpret these sentences? Okay, it's a very interesting sort of uh, thought process to go through. Okay, the second point, the reason why we can't sort of pack in the full explicit meaning into a sentence itself is that any attempt to explicitly represent background assumptions will bring in additional background assumptions, okay? So the indefiniteness of background assumptions, right? That there's no fixed number. And then also no matter how many times we bring those in, it's gonna bring in more assumptions. Any attempt to sort of, um, remove something from the background and foreground it, right, is going to bring further background assumptions in, okay? All right, and I encourage you to think about this. Do you think that uh, these are good arguments by Searle? Are you convinced, in other words? Or do you wanna write an article in the course arguing against this view, okay? Maybe you have an argument against my work on slurs. I think that would be really awesome, right? Maybe you can show that, ah, it's not the case that slurs have a context dependent meaning, but rather I can provide um, a, a single meaning, right? That is context independent. And maybe you can argue on why that single meaning is superior to my context dependent meaning, okay? And that would be really awesome, okay? At the end of the day, remember that I'm not here to judge you on which view you believe, but I'm able to help you develop your own view, right? And make sure that whatever view you believe is well supported and will argue, okay. All right, and just another cool thing that Searle argues here is that, and, and this is why philosophy of language is really cool and linguistics is really cool, is because things about language apply to the mind, right? In general, all the, the whole reason that I bring up all the focus on language in the course is so that way we can gain insight about the mind, right? It's, it's interesting in its own right, but also it gives us unique insight into what's going on with the nature of human cognition, okay? And so here we see that there is sort of applications from the argument that Searle just provided. It has further implications for uh, language in the mind, all right? So Searle argues that just as the literal meaning of a sentence will determine different truth or obedience conditions relative to different sets of assumptions, right? The literal meaning of a sentence will have different truth conditions um, depending on the background assumptions, okay? Depending on different things will make the statement true depending on the background assumptions that I have, okay? And just as this is the case, a belief or expectation 
will also have different conditions of satisfaction relative to different sets of assumptions. Okay. So this is just to highlight the important point that when we're thinking about cognition, sort of cognitive content, the content of our thoughts, right? Maybe last week you thought that we can just um, sort of articulate those in a context independent way. Here, the, the idea is that our, co our cognitions are sort of um, relative to these background assumptions, okay? Our cognitive content, our beliefs, expectations, and whatnot, okay? And this is gonna help connect us, right? The fact that we need background assumptions to interpret the literal meaning of sentences is gonna help connect us to work in speech acts and pragmatics, right? We're gonna connect locutions or linguistic items. We're gonna situate those into the context of speakers and what they're doing, okay? So the next article that we read for today is what is a speech act, all right? Now that we've appreciated the fact that a locution or a sentence is not sort of complete in itself, right? It doesn't sort of carry its literal interpretation with it. Um, now that we appreciate that language is context dependent in some sense, we're gonna situate that locution within the context of a speech act. Okay, in other words, what we're going to do in this article is we're going to appreciate uh, what a speech act is. Okay, and we'll situate uh, sentences within um, a speech act. All right, so whereas before I may have been a little bit loose with the terminology, right, like we can talk about sentences expressing things, right, um, sentences as having a meaning, right, the point that we want to emphasize today is just that that's not, that's a, just a form, a convenient form of talking, right? Really sentences don't mean anything by themselves. It's not like the sentence is getting up and doing all the work by itself, but we mean things by saying things, right? Well, it's us that mean by using words, okay? And so um, it's okay when we're doing linguistics sometimes just, you know, for because we, for the sake of, like, we can't be pinpoint, um, being super for every uh, concept. Like, we can't be modifying it with further contextual information or we'll never get anywhere with a lecture, right? So sometimes it's okay just for the sake of convenience to say, ah, this sentence means this as opposed to this. But for today, since we're talking about Searle and speech acts, we need to make clear that it's not the sentence that means on its own but it's us that we mean things when we use certain words, okay? So one of the uh, things that I wanna point out in this article is that speech acts are forms of rule governed behavior. And this is related to the work that we've been covering in the course on rules and rule following, okay? So we can think of, we've been thinking of how important rules are for, um, combining linguistic parts to form larger parts or larger constructions, okay? Um, here, we'll see that we use the notion of a rule in a slightly different way, okay? But still, we're drawing upon this notion of a rule, okay? Let me read this nice quote for you. I think it's very nice. So it is a logical presupposition, for example, of current attempts to decipher the Mayan hieroglyphs that we at least hypothesize that the marks we see on the stones were produced by beings more or less like ourselves and produced with certain kinds of intentions. If we were certain the marks were a consequence of say water erosion, then the question of deciphering them or even calling them hieroglyphs could not arise. To construe them under the category of linguistic communication necessarily involves construing their production as speech acts. To perform illocutionary acts is to engage in a rule governed form of behavior. I shall argue that such things as asking questions or making statements are rule governed in ways quite similar 
to those in which getting a base hit in baseball or moving a knight in chess are rule governed forms of acts. Okay, so we're going to um, use this idea as speech acts as, as forms of rule governed behavior uh, to, under, to get an idea of um, semantics and pragmatics. All right, we'll understand semantics in sort of a rule governed way. And then we can also think about pragmatics in a rule governed way. All right, so one of the great insights here is that we have two different types of rules, okay? So it's not the case that a rule is a rule is a rule, but there are different types of rules that can do different things, okay? One kind of rule is a regulative rule. Uh, an example of this is etiquette, okay? Etiquette is a sort of a set of rules that tell us how to behave in social situations, okay? But regulative rules regulate a pre-existing activity such as social behavior, okay? An activity whose existence is logically independent of the existence of those rules, okay? So what I mean by this is that social behavior, right? Social interaction, that already exists prior to the rules of etiquette. So it's not like social behavior is a consequence or partly a product of etiquette, okay? Social behavior is, was always there. And then etiquette is sort of rules that can help regulate that pre-existing thing, okay? We have another type of rule though, importantly, and uh, these are constitutive rules, okay? Constitutive rules constitute and also regulate an activity, the existence of which is logically dependent on those rules, okay? And a great example here is that of chess, right? The rules of chess, they both tell you how you can play. So in some sense, they're still regulative rules. However, the important thing here is that they also partly constitute the game of chess, right? It's insofar as that we, insofar as we lay down those rules that we get a game of chess. And if we didn't um, establish rules for chess, there would also be no game of chess to be played, okay? So that activity does not exist prior to the rules, right? And that's a really um, um, interesting and important insight is that some rules partly constitute or create something, an activity, okay? You might think that um, like certain laws might be of this form, right? And certain practices too. Like, can you get married without certain um, constitutive rules, right? Can you christen a boat without certain constitutive rules, right? It seems like in order for you to christen your boat, the Santa Maria, or in order for you to actually get married to someone else, that there needs to be rules that allow for those things to come into existence, right? So although social behavior exists prior to constitutive rules, institutions of marriage and institutions of christening things in certain ways, right? Like bestowing certain honors onto certain things, those sorts of activities may be partly constituted by the rules that we create, okay? And this is a, a really important insight because it can help us understand or um, think about social structures and social activities in new ways, okay? Searle argues that the semantics of a language can be regarded as a series of systems of constitutive rules and that illocutionary acts are acts performed in accord with these constitutive rules, okay? You're gonna ask me, hey Adam, what is an illocutionary act? I'm gonna go ahead and explain that to you, okay? That's another main goal for today is we're gonna discuss the difference between locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary acts, okay? Another thing we'll do today is when we get to pragmatics, we'll talk about uh, Grice's cooperative principle, and the sub rules or maxims 
um, for how we should be cooperating with each with each other. Okay, so lots of rule discussion today. Okay, with respect to uh, semantics and pragmatics. All right, so now that we have an idea of regulative rules and constitutive rules, the distinction between these rules, another important distinction for today is the distinction between a proposition indicating element or device and a function indicating element or device. Okay, Searle uses the terms element or device interchangeably in the article. I prefer the term element, but he uses the word device a little bit more consistently. So just for the sake of you tracking the article clearly, I use the term device here, okay? Another way to think about the distinction between proposition indicating devices and function indicating devices is in terms of the distinction between content and force, okay? So you can think of, when I say something to you, there is a certain content that it involves, and there's also a certain force that it has, okay? And I'll make that clear for you in this slide. Searle argues that the utterances of the sentences, John will leave the room, and will John leave the room, both of those sentences have a common propositional content, okay? And I actually made this point really clear for you in our, in one of the first lectures that we had, when I showed you, I believe it was in the introductory lecture, how we can create questions out of statements, right? Performing a WH movement, right? And that, right, the fact that we can create questions from statements, right? That there's a relationship between the surface and deep structure there that shows us that they have a common content or else we couldn't uh, turn, create one from the other, right? It's in virtue of the fact that they share a common content that I can form a, a relevant question from the statement, okay? So that insight from syntax that I showed you with the tree diagram is also just more intuitively apparent in this article, right? That this statement, John will leave the room, and the question, will John leave the room? There's something in common to both of those. What we'll say, what, what we'll call that, the thing that's in common across those cases is we'll call it a propositional content, okay? Another way that I like to think about the notion of a propositional content is think about when you have the idea that like, um, my dog is happy, okay? You can have a, a, a statement, my dog is happy, or a question, is my dog happy? But also you can entertain that thought in other languages, right? If I'm bilingual or I speak multiple languages, I might also have, uh, I might also have that same content in my mind, but in Korean, right? Or in German or in French or in ASL, right? Or in NSL, right? So it's possible for me to have that same sort of thought, right, that my dog is happy when I'm thinking in Korean or when I'm thinking in Spanish or in German or French or NSL or ASL, right? As I'm entertaining that thought, there's some common content, right, that's um, common to both the question and statement version in English, but also that's common to both the statement version in English and French and in ASL and um, LSF, right? So we see that the notion of content, propositional content is helpful and that it helps us identify what is common across those different instances, right? Or um, productions, um, linguistic productions of those sentences, okay? All right, so I hope that makes clear what we mean by propositional content. And this is also um, emphasizing that what we produce, the physical utterances that we produce, right? These are sort of like particulars, right? Like I can have a, a production in English, like the, my dog is happy. I can also have a particular production in ASL, but um, the proposition is abstract, right? The proposition is not that particular thing, but it's the abstract thing in virtue of which 
the particulars are uh, related or have something in common with each other. Okay, so a little nuanced point, but I think it's important. It's really easy in the literature to not appreciate the difference between propositions and sentences. Okay. All right. So now that we understand what propositional content is or what a proposition indicating device is, right, that sort of picks out the content of a proposition. Also notice the second thing, okay? And that's utterances of the sentences. John will leave the room. And will John leave the room? That they have, um, that these two, right? Their performances would characteristically be performing different acts and have different, excuse me, elocutionary forces, okay? So another way to say this is even though John will leave the room and will John leave the room, although that they share the same propositional content, they differ in their force, okay? So they share content, but they differ in their elocutionary force, okay? And so that in which they differ, we'll call that um, the function indicating device. The function indicating device or element highlights this part of what I'm doing in my act, my speech act. Okay, so when I say John will leave the room, right, I am giving you a declarative sentence, right, I'm stating something, right, and that has a certain force, right, and when I ask you, will John leave the room, I'm no longer stating something, but now I'm asking something, and that has a different force, right, all right, and we'll get very clear on uh, varieties of force, in a few slides where I'm going to make very clear what the distinction is between stating and requesting and promising and uh, different illocutionary acts. Okay. So for a large class of sentences used to perform illocutionary acts, the sentence has two parts, the proposition indicating device and the function indicating device. The proposition indicating device concerns rules for reference and predication, right? So think about the tree diagram, right? Like the noun phrase, I'm referring to something, right? Like Batman or Barbados or Catwoman, right? But then I'm also predicating something of them, right? Like the VP, right? Like uh, Catwoman escaped, right? Or uh, the Joker laughed, right? So we see that there's the proposition indicating device, um, concerns rules for that, right? Whereas the function indicating device concerns rules for the kind of elocutionary illocu force that an utterance has, okay? And we'll look at sort of some of the rules for that here in the next few slides. All right, so this article, I did not re um, require you to read this full article as an assignment. Um, so you don't have to read the full thing, but I do just want you to retain some of the main points that I'm going to cover right now. So this article by Bach is a really helpful article um, in that it summarizes and provides just a nice a table of uh, some of the main points that I'm going to cover. Okay, so um, you don't have to read this whole thing, but for the quiz, make sure that you're familiar with what I cover on these slides, okay? All right, so this article by Bach, it's gonna cover some important work by Austin and Grice, all right? Important figures in the field of speech act theory. One of the major figures in speech act theory is Austin, all right, J.L. Austin. He wrote this excellent book, How to Do Things with Words and I sort of pay a tribute to both Austin and Grice in my own work. Uh, I titled my article on slurs, how to do things with slurs, right? And then the second part of the title was um, a study in the way of derogatory words. And the book by Grice is um, a study in the way of words, right? So you can see that I'm, I'm uh, deeply influenced by Austin and Grice and on my own work, I just try to give them a shout out and uh, just let people know that I think that their work is really important. So 
the important insight from Austin was this distinction between locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary acts, okay? So again, we're interested in not just words, right, or sentences by themselves, but what we do with those words, right? We're situating or contextualizing sentences or linguistic items within our linguistic or communicative practice as human communicators. Okay. Also, you'll notice that in this literature, they use the term like speaker and hearer. However, in my own work, I try to move slightly past those terms. So that way we can include like signers as well. Okay. So in my own work, sometimes I, I use terms like language user or target. Um, but, you know, I just encourage you to think about being inclusive in your discussion in the philosophy of language. Okay. So in any case, the speech act we can provide an analysis at least three different levels. Okay, just similar in some sense to how we can, um, when we discussed Marr, David Marr, we can provide diff three different levels of analysis, right? When we're understanding um, like the cognitive function of something, okay? So here we can understand a speech act as having sort of three levels of analysis, okay? The first is the locutionary act. Right. And this is the act of saying something. And sometimes this is described as the what is said. OK, so in each act, like when I say something, um, part of what I'm doing in my act is I'm selecting words to use. Right. And that is the what is said part. OK, it's the act of saying something. And that has been the focus, as you can tell, of like previous lectures and like the traditional view and philosophy of language and the receive view, okay. An illocutionary act is the act of doing something and saying something, okay. So now we're getting to like using language to do things, which is really, really important, okay. So here, this is not the what is said part, but the what is meant part, okay what is meant or intended to be communicated here. Okay, so here, this doesn't have to do with the words that I'm selecting, but like what I'm doing with my words, like requesting something or promising, okay, or ordering you to do something, okay. I use the words to do that thing, okay. So we see that the locutionary and perlocutionary acts are importantly connected, but they're also importantly distinct, okay? And then next we have the perlocutionary act. And this is the act of doing something by saying something, okay? So there's sort of like a, a one word distinction here. I just want you to be clear in the illocutionary act. This is when, this is the act of doing something in saying something, okay? The perlocutionary act is the act of doing something by saying something. Okay, and the distinction to be more clear is that in the illocutionary act, this is what is meant. And then in the perlocutionary act, this is the effect. Okay, and those, the two can be different, right? You might think, oh, well, what's the difference? Like, it's the same. Like, when I use these words, like, pass me the salt, I, I am intending for you right, to pass me this, like, I'm intending you for you to pass me the salt, and it's also a request for you to pass me the salt. So how are those two different, right? In this example that I produced in the bottom, I try to make the distinction uh, super clear for you. Okay, so here's my example. So I select the words, pass the salt. That's the locutionary act. I do that to request the salt, which is the illocutionary act. And this has the effect that you pass me the salt and pepper and are slightly concerned that maybe the food doesn't taste so good, okay? And that's the perlocutionary act, okay? Notice that the consequence of what I'm trying to do with the words that I've selected may be something more than or different than what my intention is, right? Like when I say pass me the salt, my intention may be a request for you to pass me the salt, but right, the result may be something different. Like you may be offended as a consequence, right? Or you may, um, right? There's a lot of things that may be a, an effect 
but which were not intended. Okay, so it's just nice to have these distinctions here between locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary act, right? Where the first has to do with word selection, what is said, the second with intended meaning, right? What is meant, and then the third with effect or consequence, okay? All right, now for us to understand the systematic nature, right, of uh, illocutionary acts, we can see that there's a, a principled format, right, in which that we can articulate how different illocutionary acts express different attitudes as speakers, okay? I provide four examples here, and the after we look at these four, the challenge for you as cognitive scientists and linguists and philosophers of language is see if you can think of more types of illocutionary acts, right? In my work, I cover slurring, right? Ask yourself, is that a unique type of act or does that fall within one of these other types of acts? And you can think about, watch TV, read books, think about the conversations you have with your friends and your colleagues and ask yourself, try to search for acts that maybe haven't been accounted for theoretically. And what you can do, write your honors thesis, a master's thesis, or your PhD even, on something that has not yet been explored or fully developed yet. Okay, I think these would be really cool projects. Okay, so let's get a feel for how different elocutionary acts express different attitudes of the speaker. And then in the next slide, we'll look how different illocutionary acts also have different intended uh, productions in our targets, okay, or our hearers, okay, or our fellow recipient signers, okay. So uh, what is a statement? Well, a statement is an illocutionary act that expresses the attitude, belief that P, okay. So when I have a statement, when I um, produce a statement, like, my dog is happy, right? That's expressing my attitude that I believe that my dog is happy, where P is just the proposition that my dog is happy, okay? A request is an illocutionary act that expresses the attitude, desire for H to D, okay? So when I request uh, salt, I am expressing my desire for the hearer to do something, right? Like. Um, um, I want I want to express my desire for you to pass me the salt. That's the thing that you as my hearer need to do, okay? So that's what a request expresses, okay? That I have that desire, okay? Next is a promise. What is a promise? Well, and a promise is an illocutionary act that expresses the attitude firm intention to D, okay? So when I promise you something, right? Like I promise to, to um, be the best professor this semester that I can, or I promise to grade fairly, everyone's work fairly, okay? When I make such a promise to you, right? I'm expressing to you my attitude that I have a firm intention to do that thing, right? Like I will do my very best to teach you the content of the course to the best of my ability, and I have a firm intention to grade everyone's work fairly. Okay, so that is what that promise does. Okay, also uh, an apology. What is an apology? An apology is an illocutionary act that expresses the attitude regret for Dean. Okay, so when I apologize to you, maybe you sent me an email and I checked it uh, when I was out and I forgot to reply. Right. And so I apologize to you. Oh, hey, I'm so sorry that I forgot to reply to your email. Right. What I'm doing is I'm expressing regret for forgetting. Okay. So you see that even though my statement that my dog is happy, my request that you pass the salt, my promise to you that I'll grade fairly, and my apology for forgetting to reply to your email, although those are all particular things, right? Particular activities we can characterize them in a more general form. Okay? And that's sort of the cool thing that we're trying to do here, okay? And 
what we what we want to do as philosophers is we want to try to characterize the general form of this activity to the to the extent that we can. Okay, and this is how we might do that. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of like practical approaches, what I would recommend for you, like if you're interested in this type of work and you want to try to um, think about another type of act and what that elocutionary act, what kind of um, um, attitude it expresses on the part of the speaker, right? Um, what you can do first is I think it's helpful to think of a specific example first, right? Like I always give specific examples, like the statement, my dog is happy, right? Or my apologizing to you for forgetting to reply to an email, right? What I think is helpful is write out, write out a few specific examples first, and then what you can do is then provide a general form from that, right? It's, some, it's sometimes hard to think in terms of an apology expresses the regret for deing, right? But it's easier to think about when I apologize to you for forgetting to reply to an email, I'm expressing the attitude of regretting my regret for forgetting. And then what you can do is, ah, I regret forgetting. I regret something-ing, right? And now you can just erase regret, right? And replace it with a D, right? Ah, in general, whenever I am apologizing, I'm expressing my attitude of regret for something, right? Some D-ing, okay? I think that's very helpful. Be specific first and then generalize from your specific cases. All right, I can make one more point here. I'll just make one more point here. Um, this helps when you generate theory or more abstract level assertions from more particular level ones. It also helps to make sure that you don't get lost in your analysis and that you're not, that you're tracking important differences, okay? And sort of what I mean by that is one of the problems in the philosophical literature and what allowed me to make an important contribution was that a lot of scholars at the time were treating slurs in a, just a general way, right? They were just treating all slurs as S's, right? When you use a slur, you're just producing an S, right? And S was meant to capture any slur, any slur, right? The N word, um, any slur, slur that targets anyone, okay? Based on their uh, social, ethnic, or any other attributes. However, by leaving it at that generic level, it's easy to lose track of important differences between different types of slurs, right? Uh, for example, in one of my articles, uh, The Semantics of Slurs, A Refutation of Pure Expressivism, I argue that all slurs are not the same, right? Because if we look at the content, right? Like look at the content of the N-word, look at the content of slurs against Asian Americans, those slurs, track content specific to certain ethnic groups, right? In other words, a racial slur is a racial slur because it has racial content. And a sexist slur or a gender slur is a sexist or gender slur because it tracks or it includes uh, sexual or gender content, right? That's how we can distinguish between different types of slurs. And that insight is lost if we just treat all slurs as S's, okay? So uh, we would have not made that mistake if we started our philosophical analysis with careful analysis of particular slurs, right? And that's why you see in my work, I didn't just write a book on slurs, although I wrote a dissertation on the topic. What I did first is I wrote article on uh, slurs um, in group and out group uses of the n-word right slurs I wrote an article about slurs for African Americans um, I wrote about slurs that target Asian Americans I wrote an article about slurs that target um, uh, Latinos and Latinas I wrote an uh, article about slurs that target Italians right so you see that what I did is I wrote full articles focusing on specific slur types right targeting different groups and then now that I have four different articles that have carefully analyzed 
different uses of these slurs for different groups, now I can write a, a really rigorous theoretical article about slurs in general. Okay. It's not that it's not that I don't care about philosophy. In fact, I think it's very much the opposite, right? I care so much about providing a rigorous analysis of slurs at a general level that at first I do my due diligence, I do my homework, essentially in order to be a philosopher of language, I got a PhD in linguistics first, right? To understand how all these different slurs work. And then I can write a book at a more general level, ah, right? They're not just all S's, but, right? We have different types, right? And um, we'll see, right? When we get to, in the future lectures on prototypes and, um, the neuro, the cognitive neuroscience of semantics, um, we'll, we'll see, right, how uh, it's important to think at both a particular and general level, okay. This is all tying back to David Marr, different levels of analysis, right, um, implementation level, uh, computational level, right, we need to be working, going back and forth between these sort of more abstract levels and more specific levels. All right, now that we looked at illocutionary acts and how different illocutionary acts express different attitudes of the speaker, now we're gonna look and see how different illocutionary acts are intended to produce different attitudes in others, okay? Like in my targets, in my hearers or my fellow signers, okay, my sign recipients. Okay. So what's a statement? A statement is an illocutionary act that is intended to produce this attitude in the hearer, belief that P, okay? So when I, when I make a statement like my dog is happy, right? What I'm trying to produce in you, the attitude I'm trying to produce in you is that you have the belief that my dog is happy, okay? And this time, this is what I want you to believe, not just what I believe, okay? Next, what is a request? Well, a request is an illocutionary act that is intended to produce this attitude in the hearer, intention to D, okay? So when I request the salt from you, the attitude that I want to produce in you is that now you have the intention to do something for me in particular, you have now the intention to pass me the salt, okay? So when I request, right, what I want from you is that you have the intention to do something relevant for me, okay? What is a promise? A promise is an illocutionary act that is intended to produce this attitude in the hearer, belief that S will D, okay? So when I promise you that I will grade all your work fairly, I'm trying to produce in you the belief that I will do that, that I will grade all your work fairly. I want you to have that belief that I will, okay? And then finally, an apology is an illocutionary act that is intended to produce this attitude in the hearer, forgiveness of S for Ding, okay? So when I apologize to you for forgetting to reply to your email, which I hope I've actually never done that before, or at least not in this, uh, uh, not this semester, right? Um, when I apologize, what I'm trying to produce in you is that now you have forgiveness um, of me for forgetting, okay? All right, and, I, and I, in a general way, this is what we're doing with statements, requests, promises, and apologies. These illocutionary acts both express an attitude that I have, as well as are intended to produce certain attitudes in you as my conversational partner, okay? Cool. So I think that that's, uh, this is a really helpful sort of framework for thinking about what we're doing in our speech acts, okay? So I think this week is really fun because we've considered principles for how to create sentences, right? But we're also thinking about principles for how to create speech acts, right? So we, we have sort of theoretical frameworks for thinking about the cognitive science of language, both at a locutionary as well as illocutionary and perlocutionary level.
All right, next we're going to look at some work by Grice. Okay. And uh, Paul Grice is another important figure in speech act theory. And I hope that you've also noticed that a lot of this excellent work's coming out of our home institution, UC Berkeley. Okay, so I hope you're really excited about that. Okay. Um, what's important here is going to be, and the reason why we're talking about this today is because just like Austin talked about speech acts and speech activities, and Searle situated our interpretation of literal meaning within the context of our background knowledge, right? What we're going to look here is sort of continue thinking about speech acts in that um, our speech activities are things that we do with each other. And in order to properly communicate with each other, there's gonna be a principle involved guiding our communicative ex exchanges, okay? And this is gonna be called the cooperative principle, all right? So earlier in the week, we thought of principles for syntax, right? And um, earlier in this lecture, we also thought about different principles of rules um, for different speech acts. Here, we're thinking about uh, principles for cooperative communication, okay? So on the assumption that when we engage in conversation, we're cooperating with each other, some principles or assumptions should fall out of that, okay? And we'll go ahead and look at this in detail in the next few slides, okay? So, uh, the cooperative principle, I'm going to read this uh, short paragraph to you, okay? But the important insight from the principle is that when you and I are talking, even, right, even in, even in so far as we disagree with each other, or right, even if we're debating and we disagree, still, we're engaging in a cooperative enterprise, right? Even debaters are cooperating at some level, Right. What would be uncooperative is if I just got out of the room or while you were talking, I started yelling at you. Right. There are certain things that are clearly uncooperative. Right. So insofar as we continue to engage with each other in conversation, insofar as there's this back and forth going on between us, we're cooperating. Right. We're sort of like maintaining some cooperative activity. So to, or, in order to understand that, and to understand what's going on in this cooperative activity, it's not enough just to think about principles of rationality, okay? And you may have, as a traditional philosopher of language, right, or as a, a linguist, you may think that, ah, all I need to know in order to know a language is maybe just some, like, rational principles, right? You might think that, well, UG, universal grammar, and everything I need for language, that's just all, like, sort of part of my rational faculty, right? That might be something that you believe, okay? You might think that being rational is all you need to be a language user, in, a, in other words, okay? Here is a, an important challenge in that a lot of our conversational exchanges, a lot of our linguistic activity is not just regulated by rules of rationality, but also by rules of cooperation, okay? And so here you can see that we're, we're getting an important social influence, excuse me, in philosophy of language or in linguistics, okay? Before we might be thinking of language at a purely individual level, right? Maybe even at a solipsistic level. Like I might be a Cartesian, I, I might be sort of like um, just a Cartesian mind, right? on my own with no external world, right? There might be no other participants. And on the traditional view, I might think that I can in some sense still mean things and think things, determinate things, right? And sort of everything about language is given to me as a Cartesian ego, right? Here we see something very cool and noteworthy, which is that we might actually need sort of other principles social cooperative principles that help regulate our language use, okay? 
what we mean when we're doing things with our words, right? And uh, sort of a thought that I want to share with you, and I encourage you to sort of think about this on your own, is even when you're thinking on your own, like if you're Descartes and you're forming questions to yourself, right? Is this really possible um, purely on the principles of reason, like logical principles, right? Or when you're engaged in questioning yourself, right? When you're engaged in requesting or commanding to yourself, does this, the, the mental activities that you do with yourself with language, is that influenced by something like a cooperative principle, at least at some imp um, implicit level? I think that's a really interesting um, thought there, right? And it, it sort of leads us to ask the question of how social is cognition? Is it purely individual or is our cognition, even when I'm thinking on my own, is it highly social? Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and read this short um, paragraph from Grice. At each stage, some possible conversational moves would be excluded as conversationally unsuitable. We might then formulate a rough general principle which participants will be expected to observe, namely, make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. One might label this the cooperative principle, okay, or CP, okay. And that's a, a very important insight, I think. We can then derive from this general principle, given the fact that our language use is regulated not just on principles of rationality, not just on logic, but also on some principles of communication or conversation, we can then derive some uh, sub-principles or maxims, and we can call these conversational maxims, okay, but the, the important thing is these sort of fall out of the cooperative principle, okay, now that we assume or grant that, yes, we need some sort of cooperative principles to communicate with each other, we can ask, what does it take for us to be cooperative with each other, okay, and it's important to ask this because it may be the case that there's more right, more maxims, or maybe there's fewer maxims, right? So that's why I want you to understand how we get these maxims, because you, you might challenge these maxims, you might offer a different list, okay? But this is Grice's offering from 1975. We have four sub maxims, which are the maxims of manner, quality, quantity, and relation. The maxim of manner is this, Make your contribution one that is clear, brief, and orderly, one that avoids ambiguity. The maxim of quality is this. Make your contribution one that is truthful. The maxim of quantity is this. Make your contribution one that is as formative as is required, but not more so. And the maxim of relation is this. Make your contribution one that is relevant. Okay. I uploaded a copy of this article by Grice in the supplementary files. And you'll notice that there is actually a little bit more specified in these maxims, but I just wanted to provide you sort of like a, a quick synopsis of what each of these maxims entail. Okay. But I always encourage you to go read the primary source material. All right. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how we can strategically communicate things by flouting these maxims, okay? So on the one hand, we follow these maxims as co um, cooperative conversational participants, okay? So when we're uh, talking about, you know, anything in particular, like my dog or about your grade in the course, I'm gonna make sure that I'm, in general, I'm gonna be clear and brief, right? I'm not gonna spend, 50 hours talking to you about my dog, right? I'm gonna um, make sure that I make my contribution honest, right? That I'm following the maximum of quality, or I'm not gonna, in my communication with you about my dog, it's not gonna be filled with just all lies, right? That wouldn't be uh, cooperative. I will also make sure that I'm following the maximum of quantity, right? That, um, 
I'm not giving you more information that is required, right? So when I'm talking, if you ask me like how my, my dog is, how maybe if he's sick or not, I'm not gonna just give you all this unnecessary, um, I'm sorry, I'm not just gonna give you uh, all this information, right? In terms of quantity, okay? So this one has to do with uh, like the amount, manner has to do with uh, possible ambiguity, right? So it's different than amount. And then relation, the third one has to do with relevance, okay? So these three are slightly different. And I just want you to appreciate how they're different, okay? Um, and what I'm gonna do in the next four slides is look at each one in turn and show, not only do we follow these in general, these maxims in general, we can strategically flout one maxim in order to communicate something to our partner, okay? So on the one hand, I want you to understand that in general, as cooperative uh, conversational participants, we're gonna follow these conversational maxims, right? But there can be cases in which we purposely flout a maxim in order to indicate something to you, okay? And I think that this is really cool. We're gonna look at that in the next few slides. Okay. So we can strategically flout maxims to communicate information to others. The first uh, maxim we're gonna flout on this slide is the maxim of quantity, okay? And I took these examples. These are real examples from the Big Bang Theory, all right? So I just grabbed these utterances and then I explain how a particular maxim is being flouted and what is being intended by the speaker in flouting that maxim, okay? So speaker A says, is that ketchup on the table? And speaker B says, yes, it is. Here's a fun fact. Ketchup started out as a general term for sauce, typically made of mushrooms or fine brine with herbs and spices. Some popular early made ingredients include blueberry, anchovy, oyster, kidney bean, and grape. And then speaker A says, that's okay, I'll get it. Right, so uh, here speaker B's response is funny because speaker B is violating the maximum of quantity, okay? Uh, make your contribution one that is as informative as, as required, but not more, okay? So here's a fun fact, right? Just saying all this stuff about ketchup, okay? This is used for comedic purposes in the Big Bang Theory. Oh, and I wanna just point out in each of these cases, it could be possible that more than one maxim is being flouted. Okay, I'm just um, indicating what I want you to take out of this example. Okay, so flouting the maximum of quantity is used for comedic purposes in the Big Bang Theory. However, we could also strategically uh, flout the maximum of quantity to indicate something else without having to literally say it. Okay, so Notice that you may also strategically flout the maximum of quantity to indicate or imply to your conversational partner that there is something wrong with the ketchup at the restaurant uh, without literally having to say this, okay? So maybe there's people at the restaurant, like workers at the restaurant, and I don't want them to overhear me saying this ketchup is disgusting or whatnot, or it's old or whatnot. What I may do, right, is um, um, flout the, uh, a maxim, right, to indicate that there's something wrong with the ketchup, right? So you um, ask, is that, ketchup on the, is that ketchup on the table? And in general, I would take that as a request to pass you the ketchup, but here I'm not passing it to you. Right, so I may avoid passing it to you, right, and just give you some other information about ketchup, right, to indicate that, uh, right, mm, don't, <laughs> or whatever, okay, and I encourage you just to think about other examples, okay, but the important thing here is, on the assumption that speakers are following the cooperative principle, we're going to try to reason through or work out why the speaker is flouting a maxim, right, while they're communicating with us, because in general, 
they are going to follow those maxims to be cooperative. Okay, so in the cases in which someone is not flouting, uh, someone is flouting the maxim, we're going to uh, reason through what's going on there with that case. Why are they flouting that maxim? Are they trying to communicate something else to us, right? And then we'll try to figure out what it is they're communicating. Okay. And what's nice about communicating in this way, right, in this sort of indirect way, is that there's some like plausible deniability when we do this, right? As a, I can't be, I might be indicating something to you, but you can't really like pin it on me that I said the ketchup is disgusting or it's old or whatever, okay? All right, so that's an example of uh, the, ma the maxim of quantity, okay? And go to this link right here for a YouTube video that um, shows you some of these examples, okay? So I also borrowed some of these from a YouTube video, okay? All right. Next is the maximum of quality, okay? So this is an example of flouting the maximum of quality, okay? So speaker B, and here I'm just saying, there's no one talking yet, right? It's just quiet and no one is saying anything. Uh, speaker A, this is Sheldon, just out of the blue says, doesn't anyone wanna know where he's going? He's talking about Leonard here. Right, so this is really weird, right? Just out of nowhere, I'm like, doesn't anyone wanna know where he's going? And then speaker B says, uh, okay, where is he going? And speaker A says, Leonard is going to the office. And he gave, gives this really unusual hand gesture, right? And this is because for anyone that's seen the Big Bang Theory, we know that Sheldon is a horrible liar, right? Um, so we see that in this case, um, this is used for comedic uh, purposes. And speaker A's utterance is funny because uh, speaker A is violating or flouting the maximum of quality, make your contribution one that is truthful, right? It's funny because clearly Sheldon's not being truthful in this case, okay? And we um, will reason through why, what's going on there? Like, why isn't he being honest, okay? We can also flout this maxim, the maxim of quality, to indicate something to our partner without literally saying it. Okay, and here's just another example that I made up. The first examples are from Big Bang Theory, and then I just made up examples to help further clarify these for you. Okay. So now imagine you're a kid at home during a home robbery, right? So you're at home and some bad guys break in and are robbing your house right now. Okay, and while this is going on, the phone rings and the robbers tell you, answer the phone, but act normal, okay? And who happens to be on the other end is like your parents, say they're checking in on you and they call and they say, hey, how are you, right? You may not wanna literally say that you're being robbed because the robbers just told you not to say that. And if you literally, literally say the thing they told you not to say, maybe they'll get mad at you and they'll hurt you, okay? But you may wanna communicate to your parents something important without literally saying it to them, okay? So when they ask you, hey, how are you? You may say something on the phone like this. Everything here is fine and no one is robbing the house, right? And if you're young enough, right? You might get away with something like that, right? Of course, if you're old, if you're like 18 or 20, right? Um, the plausible deniability will not be there as strongly anymore. But, you know, if you're robbing a house and there's a little kid and you told them not to tell your parents that um, anything bad is going on or that the house is being robbed, a young child may say that on the phone. Everything is fine and the house is not being robbed right now, right? But, um, Notice, right, that um, on the assumption, right, so if your parents know that, hey, right, Adam's way, even though Adam's a little kid, Adam's way too smart to say something like that for no reason, right? So if Adam's telling us that no one is robbing the house, why would he say that, right? In general, whenever I call and Adam picks up the phone and I ask how, is, how he's doing, he just says everything's great, right? 
And it's just assumed that no one's robbing the house. So if I'm bringing that up for the first time here, that's bizarre, right? And that, that's flout, um, um, me saying that, right? In this weird way, right? No one is robbing the house right now. Um, I'm clearly being dishonest there, right? Um, and the my dishonesty can be taken or interpreted um, as me flouting this maxim, right? Me clearly being dishonest here can be interpreted as me flouting the maxim, and now you can investigate why I might be flouting the maxim, okay? And of course, this ends up being because I want to communicate something that I don't want to be held on record for saying, right? The plausible deniability with respect to the robbers in this case. All right. And next is the maxim of relation. So here's an example of flouting the maxim of relation. So speaker A says, uh, today I had an audition and it, okay, so let me start over. Uh, today I had an audition and it took me two hours to get there. Then I waited an hour for my turn. And before I could even start, they told me I looked too Midwest for the part. Too Midwest for the part. What does that even mean? So speaker A is frustrated that she spent all day preparing for this um, audition and didn't even really get a chance to audition because she looked too Midwest for the part. Okay, and, and notice she asked, what does that even mean, right? But clearly she's not asking for an interpretation, right? So speaker B re replies, well, the American Midwest was mostly settled by Scandinavian and Germanic people and they have a characteristic, right? this is Sheldon, of course. And speaker A replies, I know what it means, Sheldon, right? So here speaker B's response is funny because speaker B is violating the maxim of relation make your contribution one that is relevant. Okay, so for example, a more relevant response would be to offer words of comfort, right? Like that's so unfair, or I can't believe you had to go through that today, right? In response to what speaker A is saying, right? Um, it's, um, I'm not really making a relevant contribution here by explaining right, what it means to be, what it means to look to Midwest, okay? So this is used for comedic purposes in the Big Bang Theory. Um, however, we can also strategically violate the maxim of relation uh, to indicate or imply to your conversational partner, for example, that your new date did not go very well uh, without literally having to say this. So for example, someone may ask you, so how was your first date with Sarah? And your reply may be, I can't wait to go home and read the new issue of science. And um, you might say this, maybe the date was boring, but you don't wanna be mean and, and say that, right? So on the assumption that speakers are following the cooperative principle, we try to reason through why a speaker is flouting this conversational maxim, okay? And we can ask, why um, did Adam sort of change the conversation here, right? Well, probably because the date didn't, go so well, maybe he didn't enjoy it or whatever, okay. So there's another maxim in which we can flout to have a certain, produce a certain effect, okay. And again, I just wanna emphasize that certain situations may have more than one maxim that's flouted. And what it would be great for you as a scholar working on this, in, working in this area is to find something complex, like a complex linguistic exchange, and then explain exactly which principles are being maintained and which ones are being flouted and what interpretation that provides. Okay, and you can, you can even do such an analysis on a show like The Big Bang Theory, Friends, or different um, works, okay. Finally, we'll look at the maxim of manner. So flouting the maxim of manner. Speaker A says, while playing a game with fellow male friends, I need wood to build a road. Do any of you fellows have wood? And this is Sheldon, of course, right? And speakers B and C, they start laughing, right? So these are the male friends that are playing the game together, okay? And speaker A, Sheldon says, I don't understand the laughter. 
The object of the settlers of Catan is to build, to build roads and settlements, and to do this requires wood. Now I have sheep, but I need wood. And then speakers B and C start laughing again, okay? So here, speaker A's utterance is funny because speaker A is flouting or violating the maxim of manner. Okay. Violating can be taken as a more, a less intentional. Flouting, sometimes we use that word to mean like an intentional violation, okay? But we see here that speaker A's utterance is funny, right? Because Sheldon is violating the maxim of manner. Make your contribution one that is clear, brief, and orderly, or one that avoids ambiguity. So here we see that there's an amb ambiguous use of the word would, or at least this interpretation remains ambiguous, okay? The term would is ambiguous in this context between the more literal meaning and the slang meaning of the term. And that's the reason for the funniness of this example is because Sheldon is drawing upon the literal meaning and his friends are drawing more upon the slang meaning, okay? So this is used for comedic purposes in the Big Bang Theory. However, notice that you may also strategically violate the maxim of manner to indicate or imply something to your conversational partner without literally having to say it. For example, imagine that your date with Sarah actually went really well. So after dinner, you ask her, uh, would you like to come over for a drink? Um, even though you're both at a restaurant and can have another drink at the restaurant, okay? So this utterance is ambiguous uh, because we know, right, that want to come over for a drink, uh, this invitation is often used to imply something more than this, okay, or even something different than this, right? Um, putting a request in this way, however, allows for some plausible deniability, right? So maybe if you get rejected, you can say face, like, oh, I didn't mean it like that or whatnot. Okay, which can help people save face in front of each other. Also, maybe this helps prevent you from getting in serious legal um, issues, right? So we see that it's very interesting that we can have these maxims in place because on the one hand, they're important for guiding normal behavior in terms of conversational communicative behavior, right? Also, they provide us with principles that we can selectively violate or flout in order to indicate something else, right? So we see that this is actually a really rich system to explain a lot of the cool things that we do with language, okay? A lot of which is not really literal, okay? So again, whenever we have a violation or flouting of a maxim, we're always trying to work out or reason through What's going on here? Why is a speaker or a language user flouting or violate this maxim? Okay, it could be that they're just making a mistake, right? Like it's funny because Sheldon is usually not doing this on purpose, right? And so that's why this is all just generally funny, why all the maxims that are flouted in this case are just funny, right? But we can also see that when we do this intentionally, that we can sort of um, drive certain um, meanings or help other people understand what we're implying without literally saying, okay? Uh, a very famous example is in the philosophical literature it has to do with like letters of recommendation, right? Um, you, you might ask me to, to provide you with a letter of recommendation. Well, not you because I would write great letters for all my students, but imagine that there is a student that did not do great in the class, okay? But they asked for a letter of recommendation anyway, right? And imagine that, you know, I don't wanna be mean, so I agree to provide a letter, but also I don't wanna lie to the faculty at the university for, to which I'm writing a letter to. Uh, so I'm here, here I'm stuck, right? Like I wanna say something, but I don't wanna lie, right? So what I may do is write student, a has excellent handwriting and that's it, right? So you can see that what I said about student A is actually good, right? The content is positive. It says that student A has excellent handwriting, right? And that's not a bad thing, but given the background assumptions, right? Like Searle, given the principles 
of communication, the cooperative principles, right? Grice, we see that I'm not meaning, right? Or the faculty that received that letter shouldn't interpret that letter to mean that this is a good candidate for a PhD program, right? Because it's, it's assumed, right? It's sort of what's expected in a letter of recommendation from a faculty member is that I speak about your ability to do graduate level work, right? So I need to talk about things like your handwriting really has little to do with that, right? So I'm, you see I'm violating maxims here in my letter of recommendation to the faculty, okay? And they can reason through, ah, I get what Adam's doing here with that brief letter, right? And they may even further know that, ah, especially since he has published in lingu um, semantics and pragmatics, he knows what this means when he violates these principles, right? Um, so we can see how even that something that is purely positive on paper can be reasonably interpreted as not positive, okay? That this person shouldn't go to graduate school. Maybe they're not ready yet, okay? All right, cool. So these are so fun and we could spend semesters, right? Semesters talking about semantics and pragmatics. Um, but we're gonna wrap it up for today. And I just wanna um, remind you that there are plenty of fun projects that can be done using the cooperative principle and conversational maxims to analyze movies, TV shows, literature, and other media. Like maybe you wanna analyze like the speech of politicians or of comedians. I think that type of work is really cool, okay? Um, I completed my PhD in linguistics with a dissertation on the semantics, pragmatics, and cognition of slurs. There's, so there's much more fruitful work to be done here. There's been um, a flood of literature on the semantics and pragmatics of slurs. My work has been uh, hugely important in this area. And I, that's why I want you to sort of be brave and have courage and work on any topic that you think is important to the field, okay? Um, even if it, it's, it seems sort of taboo or off the well-established path, in those topic areas, there's actually much to be gained, right? Like if people are not focusing on slurs because it's taboo, they're not focusing on jazz music because it's not as well regarded as classical music, we're actually doing ourselves an incredible disservice because these are areas of research that could give us important information about language or music, right? By studying, by looking at how slurs work, right? We can learn more about language in general, right? And in fact, I think that I've discovered and other scholars have discovered a lot of interesting things about the nature of reclamation and reappropriation. Um, and the diachronic nature of language, how words can change by focusing on these issues, right? Um, and when we also consider music, um, we may gain deeper insight into the nature of musical practice by not just thinking about classical music, but by also focusing on jazz, okay? So that's why I wanna just sort of point out that no topic should be taboo or off limits as long as you approach it professionally, right? And that's how we approach all topics because we're scientists, right? We're scholars. And um, just like a doctor wouldn't avoid studying human genitalia, right? Because it's taboo, right? Similarly, we shouldn't avoid studying bad words or anything else because it's taboo, right? In fact, we need people to study those areas. Imagine if no physicians ever studied the genitalia because it was taboo, right? That would lead to major problems and advancements with you know, our understanding of reproduction, of certain diseases, right? So it's incredibly important that we don't let, right? As scientists, we need to approach every issue and approach every issue with great care and scholarship, okay? So um, as long as you're reading the literature and you're approaching topics in a principled um, scholarly way, 
then there's really nothing that you can't study. And I think that that is incredibly, um, what is it? What's the word that I'm looking for? Empowering is the word that I'm looking for, right? Like you don't just have to study vision. You don't just have to study what other people are interested in. Literally, you can study almost anything you want as long as you um, adopt the appropriate methodology, okay? All right, excellent. This is the last slide. And I just wanna point out that Berkeley is home to important research on speech acts and speech act theory, right? We've, today we talked about work by John Searle, who is faculty member at UC Berkeley. Also, we talked about the work of H.P. Grice, also a faculty member here at UC Berkeley. And also I was able to share a little bit about my work and I'm also very honored to be a part of this uh, community here at UC Berkeley. Um, so I'm really looking forward to next semester sharing uh, my work on slurs in more detail. We're gonna spend a whole course on slurs and stereotypes. Okay, so we're really gonna get a good understanding of semantics and pragmatics next semester. Okay, and also later in the course, like I mentioned before, we will retouch upon areas of semantics and pragmatics, but from slightly different perspectives. Okay, so next week we will cover semantics with regard to prototype theory or work in cognitive psychology, okay? We'll then consider semantics within the context of cognitive neuroscience, right? When we think about the processing of, um, the cognitive processing of semantics and syntax, okay? Then we will consider uh, semantics and semantics one last time when we discuss uh, truth tables, truth conditional semantics, and how that led to the development of logic gates and circuits. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention today. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.